Chapter Seven of the Typewriter Girl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Typewriter Girl by Grant Allen. Chapter Seven: A Mutinous Mutineer. I respected Rothenburg. He was a man of ideas. Of course, they were wrong, but according to his rushlights, he acted them out. He seemed to me to have a shallow brain in a constant state of feverish agitation. He was a flamboyant rhetorician a crisp denunciator it did one's soul good to hear him declaim red-hot against kings priests and the intolerable tyranny of public opinion the rest were shadows rothenburg by comparison was an intellectual titan even old mrs pritchard of the parboiled arms who lived in the community cottage with the bare bald hall recognized his superiority that there rottenborough she would say with her arms akimbo why he's worth the whole lot of em she was a study in her way mrs pritchard globular and emotional rothenburg's eloquence filled her eyes with tears why she was an anarchist i failed to perceive she seemed as much out of place in that cosmopolite crew as a free kirk elder in a chorus of menads she told me they had convinced her if so she must have had a mind singularly open to conviction i gather rather that she took to anarchy as she might have taken to primitive methodism the salvation army or any other variety of dithyrambic religion there chanced to be no shakers or mormons in the field at the moment so mrs pritchard fell back upon the allurements of communism she washed for the comrades a post you may guess which almost amounted to a ladylike sinecure when i joined the community i did so in dead earnest you may think i jest but i assure you seriously that my first intention was to live and die in the bosom of anarchy even the first sight of the ten acres with its fringe of natterjacks and its total lack of eglantine did not damp my ardour nor did the dinner at the outset i reflected that i had taught a cookery class at the guild and that i could find an outlet for my energies in radical reform of the communal kitchen it certainly afforded a noble chance for the reformer meanwhile i said nothing though i ate every meal with an increasing undercurrent of distrust as to its cleanliness at night we gathered in the community hall and decided the future of europe within as without it had anemic brick walls slightly inclined towards jaundice and under its roof we listened drearily while rothenburg settled the map of the twentieth century in unofficial harangues save for his torrent of eloquence i found the hall depressing our community shared the common mania of the sectary for placarding its sentiments only here the lord is my shepherd and god bless our home gave place to solidarite de la race humaine no king no laws no taxes das land für das volk ubi bene ibi patria and free thought free affection i read these legends over and over till they palled in another respect also my comrades resembled the universal schismatic their interests were confined to a single range they were great on altruism but one saw their eyes glaze over the moment one diverged from the beaten path of anarchic platitude rothenburg asked me the first day if i knew anything of gardening anything of gardening i could have told them at a glance that their cauliflowers were planted three inches too close while their views on spring carrots were absurdly elementary i had been reared in the country but i reflected that even among anarchists modesty befits a woman and i answered that i hoped so they wished to set me at first upon light work in the glass houses even those rough working men i could see notable mainly for the whiteness of their faces and the redness of their politics paid some homage to my gentility though they would have denied it themselves they were anxious to spare me as much as possible of manual labour but i would have none of that if i join their clan at all i must join on equal terms i am all for the absolute equation of the sexes i wished to bear my part in the burdens of the community 
so i devoted myself with a single mind to intensive culture i may be dense but after close inspection my impression is that intensive culture were it not for its name might readily be confused with ordinary gardening rothenburg was working on the foundations of a new glass-house to avoid leon whose province was potatoes i took a pick and worked by the alsatian's side he seldom spoke when he did he left off delving his shallow brain had room for but one occupation at a time it was curious to see him pause push his crush hat from his brow wipe his narrow forehead with his shirt-sleeve stroke the thin yellow hair and then give vent to some deep philosophical speculation which a child of ten might have considered profound on the second day of my task at the trench a sudden thought struck me rothenburg i said wielding my pick somewhat viciously you have bought this land how do you manage to hold it he struck work as usual and turned the watery blue eyes upon me we hold it juliet he said i was officially known to all the comrades as juliet we hold it he paused as if i were drawing a tooth we hold it by trustees no other way is possible the english law compels you my faith yes we cannot own it as a community and suppose some comrade were to refuse to work and yet stick to his rooms what could you do to get rid of him that was a problem for rothenburg he fondled the thin yellow hair till i thought it would come out he fingered the shadowy moustache with that nervous hand till he made me frightened i imagine he said at last after due deliberation in a very slow tone we would be compelled to call in the state to eject him he uttered that hated word with visible effort appello kaiserem i dug my pick into the ground more viciously than ever but i said nothing coercive practices i saw i was back with my old friends aforesaid and this indenture witnesseth yet i will do the anarchist the justice to say that none of them seemed anxious to afford their pet bugbear the state the opportunity of trying this test case they toiled hard and inefficiently in the sweat of their brow they did very little none of them could be called a specialist in gardening rothenburg himself had worked as a lady's tailor in paris he told me and had flung up a post of fifty francs a week not bad wages for a working man he observed preening himself with the complacency of a willing martyr to till the soil with intensive culture i believe he was really a good tailor spoiled to make an indifferent gardener still one could not help respecting his enthusiasm when i pressed him further on this head he admitted with regret that in the present state of the world only a chosen few like you and me juliet were fit for anarchy i felt half inclined to retort with the last of the sandemanians that i was no that sure of juliet however he thought it was well to begin the experiment after all one should live up to one's highest ideal i glanced around at the sodden field the bald brick cottages and had doubts in my mind whether they did really fulfil my highest ideal i worked hard with the rest a certain sense of honour made me work my hardest noblesse oblige and precisely in proportion as i saw the comrades would be content to let me shirk some share of my task out of regard for my gentility did i feel it incumbent upon me to do my utmost possible i wore my cycling suit in the fields and laboured like a man i am not muscularly strong but i have been well trained and i honestly believe i was the most efficient workman in all that little group of incompetent town toilers in my spare time i set about reforming the kitchen the vegetarian dishes i had learned at the guild delighted the souls of the simple anarchists my barley cutlets with tomato sauce were voted heavenly in best lick-lipping teutonic my vermicelli shape received the praise of bravissima from our neapolitan luigi this skill in cookery much increased my vogue among the men of the community while the women were not sorry to have their task lightened by a little amateur assistance 
if i have not said much here of the women and children tis not for want of appreciation they were the salt of the settlement there was no nonsense of high principles about them they had followed their husbands and fathers and brothers to this outland spot as women will do and they would have shouted vive l'empereur as heartily to-morrow as they shouted vive l'anarchie when asked to-day but they loved to applaud rothenburg on the war-path of peace and would have scalped any one who doubted the truth of the shibboleths of fraternity with the children i made great friends dear rough and tumble little things they oozed with merriment my rational dress delighted them so did mr commissioner with his white teeth as soon as they had got over the first formalities he suffered them to pull his tail like a lamb we played games together at night in the intervals of reorganizing european affairs and abolishing the capitalist we romped like tomboys my attempts to tell them cinderella and the three bears in bad german translated by the more knowing into czech and yiddish were not a complete success but neither were they a failure for at any rate they resulted in happy laughter besides i taught them cat's cradle and cat's cradle at least has escaped the curse of babel still rocks lay ahead my odyssey was not so quickly to bring me into port by the end of the week a cloud took shape i foresaw storms brewing all the comrades were devoted in equal parts to myself and my bicycle in the evenings when work was done and we had watered the cabbages i gave them lessons in turn on the mysterious monster from the beginning it occurred to me that most of them were anxious to entice me away from the common field towards remoter lanes where occasions for private talk were more easily obtained but mindful of my promise not to form idolatrous attachments i resisted the temptations of the polyglot fausts who would fain have discoursed to me the words of love in many uncouth languages it was my policy to keep close to the cottages and the other women backed up by that round mountain of britannic matronhood the guileless mrs pritchard besides in the commissioner i had an efficient bodyguard on saturday came the weekly division of profits we had done well that week having sent consignments of early roses and asparagus to guildford and london we declared a dividend a splendid communal dividend at the rate of four shillings per head for adults and two shillings for children i thought this profit magnificent but just before the distribution of cash rothenburg strolled up to me as i was dandling a mottle-armed anarchist his fingers twitched on the imperceptible moustache more tremulously than ever juliet he said briefly i want to speak to you he said it in the voice with which our principal at college was wont to summon us to her study for the discipline of exhortation free anarchist though i was i listened and trembled well rothenburg i murmured laying down the baby the question is do you mean to remain with us why certainly i cried astonished did we not swear eternal friendship but the comrades complain that you take no notice of them no notice absurd why i have taught them how to bicycle yes but that is not everything friends should show friendliness you hold them at arm's length you keep yourself aloof you have no camaraderie i looked him hard in the face he blinked his watery eyes i knew he was sincere a good honest anarchist but he expected too much of me rothenburg i said firmly i call this coercion no no not coercion but comrades ought to be sociable tis intolerable i exclaimed what is anarchy for if we are each to be forced into talking to one another against our wills i have done my week's work i have cooked you good food i have lent you my bicycle and still you complain of me the banded despots which was our technical phrase to wit for the british government could not do worse than that nor as bad as that either they do not insist that one should make one's self agreeable they are amply satisfied if man pays man's taxes he twirled the non-existent moustache 
till he put a visible point on it. His fingers twitched painfully. I only tell you what the comrades are saying, he replied, in a deprecatory way. They find that you do not behave to them like a sister. In one word, they think that you give yourself the airs of a superior person. You pose as an aristo. They believed when you came that you would amalgamate freely with us. We want no women who decline to fraternize. This was too much for my temper. I broke into open mutiny. I shall resign, I cried. You are bringing to bear against me the intolerable tyranny of public opinion. I shall go back to the freedom and comfort of the despots. His jaw dropped at this resolve. His eye glanced feelingly sideways towards the bicycle. For a moment I feared Commissioner Lin would pin him. No, no, he cried. You must not do that. We all like and respect you. We wish you to remain, but we wish you to be a sister. Give me time to consider, to communicate with the comrades. Not one moment, I answered, hardly liking this turn. Hand me over my money and let me go. I have worked for a week, and the labourer is worthy, at least, of his travelling expenses. I returned to London. He hurried back to the group who hung about the door of the community cottage, and spoke to them in low tones. Then he came again as envoy. All the comrades say, if you will reconsider your decision, they will no longer insist upon your altering your demeanour. I will not reconsider it, I replied, growing really frightened, for I caught Leon's eye. I go at once. Give me my money, and let me return to the world I came from. They debated again. Commissioner Lin watched the case in my interest. Then one of the others approached. It was Leon, Caliban, the man with the protruding lips. I had my hand on my bicycle, and was ready to mount it. This machine is ours, he said calmly, putting his face close to mine. Whatever any comrade brings into the community is common property. We will give you your dividend and let you go, but this you must leave with us. My blood was up. The old Eve within me was roused. The American eagle in my heart flapped its wings. I remembered how my fathers had fought at Lexington. They were quite a property to me. Sir, I exclaimed in my most commanding voice, you shall not touch my machine. If you venture to detain it, I tried to remember the worst phrases I had learnt at Floor and Fingelman's. I will move for a mandamus to compel you to show cause why you should escape the penalties of premunire. What it all meant I do not know, but I am sure the effect upon Caliban's mind was most salutary. I have ever since had a vastly increased respect for the law of England. They conferred again for a few minutes with one eye on the commissioner. Then Rothenburg came forward once more as spokesman. Will you try it again for one week? he asked in a really grieved voice. We shall be sorry to lose you. Not for one day, I answered, a furtive gleam in Commissioner Lin's eye, lending me courage. Give me what I have earned, and let me go. I asked for it with the greater confidence, because I felt sure, in my own mind, I had done more effective work in the week than any of them. They paid me, murmuring. I retired to my cubicle, packed my knapsack in haste, returned to my machine, and laid my hand on it firmly. But within I was trembling like an Italian greyhound. Then I jumped into the saddle and waved my hand to my sworn brothers with an affectation of courage. Monsieur, I said, and to call them monsieur was to excommunicate myself, to deny camaraderie. Monsieur, you are a mass of conventions. I wish you the very good morning. Your rules are too stringent for me. I cannot away with them. I find myself too individual, too anarchic for the anarchists. Then I waved my hand again, and set my face sternly towards civilization, despotism, and the flesh-pots of Egypt. I was weary of dissent, and longed for the Catholic Church of Humanity. I must go back to London, and be once more a typewriter. End of chapter 7